Hey, before I start, I made a few actual real life enamel pins. Some of you might know these designs from my Instagram, but now you can buy them in a the form of a pin. They're huge and so sick. I love them. And if you order them now, you'll get a 50% discount if you use the code new plastic at checkout. Link in the description. Okay, now we can start. Color gamut. Render transform. Scene referred. Display referred. ICC profile. Transfer function. SRGB. Linear. White point, chroma clip. Highlight white clip. Gamma, R P D C L P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P D S F P it's kind of insane to realize that this thing that literally everyone who works with in digital image making is also literally rocket science. And most artists just somehow thug it out, their images end up looking okay, so why bother with all this color management stuff? And I agree to a certain point, but every now and then you'll hit that brick wall that is the limit of your knowledge and you realize you've been walking in the dark your whole life with your hands reaching out hoping to get somewhere, anywhere. And me, I hate that feeling. So I read and I ask and I research and I read more and I get more and more confused and I realize fuck this dude I understand less than I did yesterday and I know you had the same experience and I'm here to tell you it's okay. Color grading is a profession. In any serious project there's people who only do that as their job. So how can you be expected to know what they know? But on the other hand more and more of us are what known as 3D generalists and the good thing about it is that you can do anything. You get more work opportunities, more money, more fame, more screaming fans, a big house, articles written about you, right? The bad thing is that you kind of need to know a bit about everything. And color management, ladies and gentlemen, is one of those everythings that you need to know about. And maybe a better way to phrase it is digital imaging instead of color management. Because we are dealing with a complex journey of color science in the digital image making world. So am I going to teach you that? Nope, I don't know enough to do that. And every single goddamn thing about this digital imaging stuff is a huge rabbit hole. So it's impossible to do that over one video. What I am gonna do is go over a few key terms and hopefully clear them out for you. So when you do your own learning and deep diving, you could hopefully understand the more complex stuff better. After that, we'll see how we can render out ACES and AGX from Octane to After Effects and maintain a correct color pipeline to get the best looking renders. I want to give a huge shout out to Elijah Sakia. He not only has this website full of valuable information about digital imaging, reading his website is what made me realize how much I, and probably you, don't know about digital imaging and kickstarted this whole video. I also reached out to him to clarify some confusing aspects and he gladly helped me out. So a huge thank you to him. You should definitely check out his website if you want to learn more about this. Another very valuable website is by Chris Brejan or Chris Bejan or Chris Brejan. So much accurate, reliable and digestible information over there. And the third website that helped me figure out just what the fuck all this means is the Hitchhiker's Guide to Digital Color, a website by Troy Sabatka, who is also the man behind AGX. This website literally takes you by your hand and guides you through this confusing and chaotic world. So do yourself a favor and after this video, go to all these websites and read through them. I'll put the links in the description. Check out the Gumroad store. There are many great model and texture packs there that I'm sure you'll find useful for your work. Also consider supporting on Patreon and membership. You can get these project files as well as other cool perks, but mostly help me make more and better content for y'all. Follow me on Instagram at ojang. Subscribe, share, comment, bell. Stop everything and finish that one project you've been putting aside for months. Now, do it. Let's go. So why manage colors? Two reasons. One, because color doesn't really exist. I mean, it does in our minds, but in the physical world, it's just a tiny piece of radiant energy, aka electromagnetic radiation. And in the digital world, it's just data. So we need a reliable system to translate that data into perceivable colors on a screen in a predictable way. We see a red ball, we take a photo of it or make it in 3D, and we want to end up seeing the same red ball on the screen. The screen doesn't know what a red ball is, it's up to you and the color pipeline you follow to help you get that red ball on the screen. The second reason is consistency. Every phone, laptop, desktop, projector, operating system has their own different ways of interpreting and displaying colors. Having a correct workflow will help you decrease the amount of expected and unexpected differences in the image you create between different systems. And to state the obvious, Everything I talk about is regarding the RGB color model, since other color models like CMYK or LAB or whatever aren't really relevant to CGI. So first thing, 
What even is a color space? Well, we first need to have a color model, which in our case is RGB. We all kind of know what this is, a model that takes three color components, red, green, and blue, and through a mathematical system, mixes them in an additive way to produce a large number of the colors the human eye can see. The descriptions and implementations of how the colors are produced, of the exact relationship between the data and the perceived colors, is the color space. So, the visible color spectrum to the human eye has been translated into XYZ values in what's known as the CIE 1931 color space. It's a three-dimensional model, but you're likely familiar with the 2D slice that looks like this. This is pretty much the first color space ever developed back in 1931. The modern color spaces we know and use today like sRGB, Rec 709, Adobe RGB, Photo RGB, Rec 2020, Asus, amongst others, are different spaces that are defined within that CIE 1931 space. If a space says, my red is XY41 in the CIE space, everybody knows what they mean. We're about to enter a rabbit hole if we keep talking about this, so I'll move on. Every color space consists of three components. The color gamut, which is the range of colors dictated by the coordinates of the RGB within the CIE 1931 space. Each color space has a different range or spectrum in which it processes colors defined by the three points of the RGB. These are called the primaries for that space. As you can see when you work in the ACES color space, the potential range of colors is absolutely huge compared to sRGB. The second component is the white point, which dictates what is considered full white based on the CIE 1931 space. sRGB and Rec 709 are different color spaces that share the same color gamut and mostly the same white point. The only significant difference between them is the transfer function, which is the third component. More precisely, a color component transfer function. This is what is widely and incorrectly known as gamma, gamma correction, or gamma curve. The term gamma is obsolete and wrong. Even the creators of the sRGB color space back in the 90s said it was incorrect. So I won't use the term gamma, even though some programs are still stuck with this term for various reasons. To really understand how the transfer function plays into color management, you're probably gonna have to learn math, physics, and electricity. After reading a ton and watching a ton of videos about this, I came to this conclusion. Most people don't really know what this means or don't know how to explain it. The ones who do know what it means explain it using complex terms that require prior math and electrical knowledge. Either way, you end up more confused than you were before. So, transfer function is a formula that describes the relationship between color data and brightness input or output. Throughout your workflow, from creating a scene to displaying the final image on your monitor, there are three different transfer functions being used. While you're working, there is a linear function. When you export your render into a JPEG or a PNG file, a nonlinear function is applied. And when you display your image, a reversed nonlinear function is applied. Let's dig into what is actually happening in each part. Here's a graph. The x-axis represents light intensity from dark to light, and the y-axis represents RGB intensity data from zero black to one white. The most obvious relationship would be a linear relationship. 25% light intensity equals 25% RGB intensity. Doubling the light intensity would double the RGB intensity. So both would be 50%. This linear relationship is how your 3D program should be calculating all the light and color information. If you have a light source and a 25% gray color value, doubling the light intensity will make the gray twice as bright. So 50% gray. The reason we need this linear calculation in the program is because math. All the data being calculated to generate colors simply works better this way. Also, this is how the real world functions. Doubling the light intensity means doubling the brightness. And again, I'm really using simple and dumb terms here because we're on the verge of another rabbit hole. This is the beginning of a linear workflow and why everyone who knows anything tells you to keep your octane or whatever 3D engine you use in linear workflow. Linear is not a color space. It's the transfer function you work under. It's the third component of a color space. When you're done with your scene, you can render it out as an EXR using the color gamut and white point of the sRGB color space, but a transfer function that's linear. This is what happens when you render in linear sRGB. 
but you can also save your image directly as a JPEG in the sRGB color space. You just encoded all the color information into an image file using the sRGB color space. When you do that, a different nonlinear transfer function is applied. This new curve describes a nonlinear relationship between the light intensity and the RGB values. That means 25% light intensity will equal kinda more like 50% RGB brightness. And 50% light intensity will equal kinda more like 75% RGB brightness. The reason for this is on the verge of another rabbit hole, so I won't try to explain it too much. But very basically, this is a more optimized way of saving that information in a digital way for it to be displayed correctly. You gotta remember that EXRs are not meant to be displayed, but JPEGs are. And even though a linear transfer function is better for light calculations, viewing it would look bad. There will be way too much visible highlight information that we don't need and not enough visible information in the dark areas. Now coincidentally, the perceived brightness in the human visual system has roughly the same non-linear formula. To our eyes, 25% light intensity will actually appear more or less 50% bright and 50% light intensity will appear more or less 75% bright. This actually, from what I understood, has nothing really to do with the reason why sRGB transfer functions are this way. The main reason is for optimization. The fact that we have a similar transfer function in our eyes is kind of a fluke. Remember, our eyes perceive brightness this way in the real world, where the light intensity brightness relationship is linear. So the object being lit is lit linearly, but we perceive it non-linearly. If we were presented an image already adjusted to that non-linear relationship, it would actually appear too bright for us. And more importantly, if we take an image with this transfer function and started editing, blending, and color grading, the math behind it will break and everything will look horrible very quickly. So now you're left with a JPEG encoded in this nonlinear transfer function that also won't look right. Well, that's because there is a third transfer function applied by your monitor. In this graph, you have the RGB values and the light intensity of your display monitor. Your display monitor applies a third transfer function when decoding your image for viewing, which is basically reversing the sRGB encoded one. This transfer function takes the RGB values encoded in your image and tells your monitor how bright the LED lights should be accordingly, since your monitor uses actual LED lights to display everything. What that means is that after this reversed function is applied, the relationship between light intensity and RGB values are back to linear. Now that they're back to linear, we can view them correctly because we view them in the real world using real world lights, the LEDs in our monitors. And like we said, in the real world, light intensity brightness relationship is calculated linearly. So to sum it up, when you work on your file, either in your 3D program or on the rendered EXR in your compositing software, you work under a linear transfer function. When you export a JPEG, it encodes a non-linear transfer function, which is meant only to be displayed. You don't want to make any color edits on this file anymore. To be displayed correctly, your monitor applies a third transfer function that reverts the lightness-brightness relationship back to linear. That's pretty much it when it comes to transfer functions. I skipped many rabbit holes along the way, but I feel like this way, an ignorant like me has an easier time understanding what's going on behind the scenes, which hopefully means I can make less mistakes and learn related information quicker. So we're talking about saving your image as a JPEG. Why people keep telling me to save my file as a 16 bits per channel linear sRGB EXR, you might ask. Well, that's because you can take that file and do more work on it after you rendered it. That's called post compositing. When you import that EXR into your compositing software, you have so much data encoded into it. 16 bits per channel float is more than enough for beauty and light AOV passes and 32 bits per channel for data passes that can benefit from that extra precision and information. And this data is encoded linearly, so you can continue to manipulate it, change colors, change exposure, blend, blur, and all sorts of stuff in a linear way, which is the way where the math done for all these things is done correctly. The cool thing about EXR is that you can compress that information in different ways so you can actually have pretty lightweight EXR files that still hold all that information. By the way, the float part means that data is stored using floating points as opposed to integers 
which basically means you have the potential to hold potentially infinite amount of data values and even negative values, even though it comes at the expense of the accuracy of that data. Again, the accuracy doesn't really matter for beauty and light passes. That need for accuracy, which comes with 32 bits per channel, only matters for data passes. Once you're done with your post work, you can then export that to a JPEG where the file is finally being encoded in the regular nonlinear sRGB space, also simply called sRGB. We're going to learn how to do that in the next tutorial for ACES and for AGX. Now, let's talk about PNGs for a second. Do yourself a huge favor. Be the professional you always strive to be and get PNGs out of your workflow. Rendering PNGs out of your 3D program is like planting the seed of a huge tree in a tiny flower pot. Instead of getting the full potential of the data your scene holds, you trash it into a file format that simply isn't capable of holding it. One thing you should understand when it comes to digital colors is not to trust your eyes. A lot of the times you need to trust the numbers. Your eyes might say, oh look, this PNG looks fine. But the numbers, Chico, they never lie. EXRs or TIFFs should be your only render options. It's just a damn shame to destroy your render in a PNG. Your final image output after post work should be a simple JPEG since it's a much friendlier and a much better compressed file than PNGs. Don't be that person who says who cares because it's just not professional, especially if you are a professional. So the linear to nonlinear transfer function helps us compress the brightness values in a more optimized way in an image file in a way that looks correct to us on a display monitor. But that's not all that needs to happen for you to view an image correctly. As I mentioned several times, your rendered EXR is just a data file. In the real world, your eyes can only see a tiny portion of the full radiometric spectrum, a portion we call color. And similar to that, in the digital world, your display monitor can only display a tiny portion of all the data being generated inside your render engine. The batch of calculations and actions that compress and retarget all that high dynamic range into something that could be correctly displayed on your standard monitor is called a display render transform. Or a render transform, or a display transform, or an output transform. Yeah, the color science community is all over the place. I like the way Chris Brejean explained it on his website. Display, the monitor, screen, render from data to image, transform, changing the values, primaries, white point, and transfer function. So applying a render transform is basically changing the primaries, white point, and transfer function data values from your scene or EXR file to an image that can be displayed on your screen. Part of the render transform process is tone mapping, compressing and retargeting the brightness values. Another part is gamut mapping compressing and retargeting the gamut. ACES calls it ODT and RRT, AGX calls it DRT, but they all do the same things. It's very technical, but it also ends up being a crucial part of the aesthetics because every formula does it slightly differently, which results in a slightly different look. I mean, honestly, the main reason 3D artists use ACES is for its rendering transform and not for the huge potential of color data that ACES holds. We went over the differences between those looks in the last tutorial where we examined the differences between ACES and AGX. There's another method you probably heard about, highlight compression. That's a sort of a tone mapping slash rendering transform that's being done within Octane. And it looks fine, but it's definitely failing to compete with how ACES and AGX do it. When you work on your scene, even though everything is calculated linearly, your live viewer window is applying a render transform so you can view your image correctly. Then when you render it, you need to reapply that render transform in your post compositing software. Okay, that's enough for now. In the next tutorial, we're going to be more hands-on looking at how to correctly export an EXR from Octane and working on it linearly in After Effects, both in ACES and in AGX. This used to be a very clunky and convoluted workflow, but it has gotten much easier. That will guarantee the best looking results. And if you're doing anything in post, you want to make sure you work this way. Check out the enamel pins, browse through the Gumroad store or consider supporting on Patreon and a subtle nod to my nifty patrons and members. Yin and Gong, Guillaume Lopez, Dave Toro, Marie Robbins, Spoyas Chari, Eric Hu, Daniel Larry, Minky Kim, Hader, Leo, Peter Rodiger, Yun Ji Shin, Chris Hyde, Alda Boyd, Farong Farong, Katie Royal, Derek Fredrickson, Vico Sun, Ruby Nine, Lucas Franche, Tell Me More, Jaskirat Pandreth, Bori, Jin Kwang Wu, 
Eric Lofton, 3D Monkey Biz, Arlen, Suki Violet Sue, The 22 Design, Joel Rieger, Adrian Desolet, Derek Schultz, Maurice Hickendorf, Studio Image, Matus Jujuzajewski, Blue Hamel, Joshua Akoy, Punksukornim Siri, Webb, Kong Idiot, Maddie DeGueldre, Cho Young Jun, NZE, IEMN, Golfino666, Ali Asser, Leandro Marimon, May, Balgasm, Shane, Perry Cooper, Hannah Kazeka, Oisin O'Brien, Joel Taylor, Fo Major, Kevin Quintero, Jeremy Bajana, Christina, Javola Tong, Yatsu, Raquel Vela, Ezekiel Grand, George, Alex Jing Young Cho, Matez Sarkozy, Akila Bedoya, Onur Koroglu, Takeyuki Chiba, and everybody else on the list. Thank you so much. I love you. Have a great day. Peace.